Good afternoon, everyone. This is Billy McDermott from Canada ID. It's two minutes past 12 on Tuesday, the 18th of December. Um, hope your run up to Christmas is all going well. I hope you're looking forward to your break. If you're lucky enough to have some time off, just to rub it in, I finish tomorrow at 12 p.m. Can't wait to get finished and start, start relaxing um, after what has been an, an absolutely brilliant year here at Canada ID. Um, to finish off the year, I'm, I'm delighted um, to be joined by um, one of my favourite Scottish expats, um, someone who I'm lucky to call a friend, who I, I met a couple of years back when I was over in Sydney, but we've kept in touch since. Um, he's been a clan, Candidate ID client as well in a, a previous employment. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm with Neil Gunning. Neil, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Would you like to tell everyone a little bit um, more about yourself and what you're what you're doing at the moment? Sure. Thanks, Billy. And I think your timing's off a little bit, mate. It's uh, it's three minutes past eleven at night, so I think you need to correct the uh, correct the watch there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and um, you know, so my name is Neil Gunning. I'm the head of talent acquisition for um, for currently Cover Genius. Um, I've been around the talent acquisition traps for far too long, and I've got the war winds and the and the grey here to prove it. And um, and yeah, my, generally my, my niche within the market is scaling tech businesses, and uh, that's what I've uh, I've recently joined uh, Cover Genius, a fintech business focusing on the insurance market, um, to to help them go through that uh, that scaling challenge and the complexity that, that comes with that. So yeah, that's me. Brilliant, and and that means you know you're you're just out the traps and, and your new gig two and a, two and a half months and you're you're perfectly um, that combined with your your substantial experience means we're we're perfectly primed to talk about um, our subject today, which is um, in, improving recruiter uh, productivity and and we're going to come at this from from a couple of different angles. Naturally, we're going to come at it from from a candidate ID perspective about okay, you know what do our clients do to 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 reduce the amount of time that recruiters are actually spending on what we deem to be unnecessary tasks. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, how we can free up their time to focus on what we think is the real, um, the, the real valuable um, tasks involved in recruitment. But also, Neil, from your perspective, from a quite a pragmatic day-to-day -day perspective, what, what else, you know, what are your recommendations for, for, for maximising productivity and, and improving the performance of, of uh, you know, a recruitment team and, and, and pushing them toward, you know, there, do you know what, there's no easy fix to, to, to this. There's no easy, easy way to, um, you know, making a turning your recruitment team into into high performing team but but you know my my objective with this session for the next 30 minutes or so is to give you one or two takeaways everyone that you can you can take that you can probably implement pretty quickly and I'm pretty sure Neil um, will, will be able to to do the, the same thing um look to, to start off with let's look at you know a really high level um thing here you know why is recruiter productivity um a, a real problem um for, from from our perspective it, it's quite simple only three or four percent of candidates are actually ready for a hiring conversation um as we speak that includes your passive candidates that includes your active candidates um i hate using passive and active terminology but you know it is what it is there are people who are applying for jobs actively there are people who will have want to have a conversation with you um who aren't applying um for, for, for jobs naturally but actually you know only a small percentage of you know the total addressable market of candidates is ready to have that conversation right now so as recruiters we get into a situation where we're trying to target 96 97 98 percent of the market we're trying to speak to as many people as we possibly can but actually only only a tiny tiny amount of people are are actually ready for that converse, conversation right now so so okay yeah you might think that a lot of that's relationship builds you know you speak to someone now you know they might be ready for a conversation in six to nine months time but if you're manually speaking to people um if you've not got any platform or tool or process in place that lets you have conversations at scale you're you're, you're wasting a huge huge amount of time there Neil, Neil, was that a problem that that, that you've you've saw in terms of? You, I know your background predominantly, predominantly is within technology recruitment, um, but have you experienced the issue where um, your team or, or you you know you've been contacting too many candidates? You you're you're 
you know, perhaps not not wasting time. It's it's perhaps not the right word, but you 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 realise that you need to speak to a lot of people in order to to meet your uh, to meet your volumes, particularly when you're in scale up mode. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, low value activity is like the devil, uh, and and well, and any anyone who's heading up any TA function or for for TA practitioners, um, you know, low value activity, and and you know, you, you mentioned there, yeah, three or four percent of candidates are ready for a hiring conversation. That doesn't mean you have to be speaking to the other ninety six percent because the nurturing can happen with the you know the peripheral sort of three or four percent on either side. Um, that that where those those conversations are likely to turn into something when you convert them into that three or the, the target three or four percent. But in general, low value activity is the devil. Um, I avoid it like the plague. Um, and generally, you know, everything from our candidate attraction, you know, uh, candidate attraction methods, and all the way through pipelining, everything. If something has to be done more than a couple of times, it should be automated. And I'm not saying that in a buzzwordy, let's just chuck out automation and AI and blockchain and, you know, and throw out buzzwords. Um, I mean, in a way that, you know, it's just quite simple. Something, it can be a really simple automation, but something just to remove the, the need to have to do anything repetitive or do anything that's not going to actually move the dial forward towards, you know, towards the hiring goal. Um, so, so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely a problem and it's something that, you know, we, um, you know, as you're building out what your frameworks and your methodologies and your processes should look like, um, it should have that, at the core that you're building from. It's, it's, this is my favorite, favorite gift that I've got on the screen just now, um, herding cats, you know, any, anyone that knows me knows, that knows that I normally drop cat related stuff, um, and, into the, into the, the presentation, into the deck, but, you know, ultimately, this is what it is, do you know. This this is what we we spend our, our lives doing as recruiters. Even when I started in two thousand and five, I was recruiting in financial services. That that's you know exactly exactly what I did. I was spending time corralling candidates, speaking to as many people as possible, being put under pressure by my manager to to hit KPIs, to speak to five hundred candidates a month. I think the, the the figure was. Do you know what, what, how am I going to fit that in? You know how as a recruiter am I going to speak to to so many people in such a short period of time when I've got got you know stakeholder calls to do where i've got cvs to send where i've got um face-to-face -face interviews to do it's, it's just 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 crazy you know um in fact i think that last guy carrying the two cats there is is literally me um when when i'm actually trying to trying to recruit and and it's it's funny you know i um you know, I am hands on recruiting myself at the moment for our team. You know, we 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 are recruiting. Um, you know, we've recruited for customer success people, um, technical people, um, demand gen specialists, etc. Just now, and even with a small volume of hires, you know, we've got seven people starting in, in January and February. The the volume quickly quickly adds up. You know, the, I'm going to use some some analogies here. Do you know, why is this happening? Right. First of all, the, the the net is spread far and wide, and you've got a really really general type of net. So even if we think about basic sourcing, we think about basic advertising. You know, you're you're putting out jobs onto um, sites where it's active candidates who perhaps don't quite um, hit the mark. Your sourcing is probably going to be a little bit more tailored, but again, you're you're you know talking to to a high high volume of potential candidates, whereas you all actually only want a really specific type of fish. You know, I'm, I'm stealing analogies here from Scott, our, our chief operating officer, left, right, and centre. But I think I think they're really, really valid. You know, that that net and the spread mean that you're catching the wrong type of fish, but you've already spent the money on catching them. Um, you know, I'm sorry, there's a wee typo there. You need to chuck them back in the sea as opposed to check them back into the sea um, as you can't use them. So, so you're getting into a situation where you know you're, you're quite often our clients are getting. You know, ten times more the the amount um, of um, interest, ten times more the amount of applications that they, that they really need, uh, and it just creates that that all you know that that backlog. You're and then the consequences of that backlog are significant. You 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 don't have the time to actually service the candidates properly, so that creates um, a, a real issue in terms of candidate service levels you're also going to miss candidates because you don't have the time to actually go through the the the, the applications or the cvs or the notes of interest and um, properly as well so so there's just so many issues that you know we could spend a I feel I were into all all the different issues that come come with that high volume of applications. Neil, Neil, from a you know a non-candidate ID and a non-marketing perspective, what what tactical um, 
processes have you implemented in the past that, that allow you to, to cut down um, the amount of irrelevant um, interest, the amount of irrelevant applications that you're actually getting so that, so that your team are focusing as much as possible on people who are of interest? Yeah, so from a pure advertising perspective, um, you know, yeah, I think we've all, anyone who's, who's you know, sort of earned a war wins over, over a few years of a career in TA, um, they've seen those sort of the, the static job boards that, um, you know, where a huge uh, candidate market can just go and they can, you know, have easy apply buttons and they can just be sitting on the train on the way home and you're just, you know, clicking apply, they're not even checking the ad, but just looking for a job, they've had a bad day and they're just clicking the ad and you end up with a database full of, you know, irrelevant CV. Um, uh, you know, if you, as you're building out a process and, and as you're building out a, a platform and a, and a TA ecosystem, you need to be taking that into account because that is where, you know, as well as the other candidate streams, you know, sourcing or, you know, as you're trying to kind of turn that candidate traffic inbound from employer branding, etc. If just focusing on advertising platforms, um, my my way of doing uh, doing that is using um, non-static job boards, algorithmic um, you know sort of marketing job boards, and job boards will actually use the content to target specific people based on that content. Um, I won't name names because I'm not into you know undue branding, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, you know, I use you know specific platforms that are one global. Predominantly, my roles tend to be you know heading up the, the global function, so I need to be thinking outside of just the region. Then um, I then need to think about integratability into the internal systems to make sure everything can be source tracked, so that later you can do your ROI calculations. But then I need to make sure that on the one hand, I'm opening up to the broadest number of candidates available. So the amount of traffic on those platforms is important, but then its ability to segment that traffic. Um, based on the content you put in your ads. Um, and then beyond that, I actually take it a step further from a pure tactical perspective. I, you know, in, in my company now, for example, one thing that we're really quite passionate about is our, is our values. They're not just, you know, the fluffy poster on the wall, at the, the lunchroom that you walk by and nobody actually knows what they are. Um, so as well as targeting a core demographic, um, you know, from a, you know quite a vast pool, we then ask them to um, answer four questions that aren't related to the functional knowledge or whatever the standard stuff. We ask them to speak to some examples of, of things that they've done in relation to our values. Now, what that does is two things. One, yes, you're going to get some candidate drop off because you'll see some questions and they'll go. But realistically, do you want the ones that are that when you're making it clear that your values are important to you? Do you want the candidates that are you know? just quite you know too lazy to to answer those questions and come into your ATS so you know all of those you know before they even come into your your database one you're making sure that you're honing in on a much more valid um, segment of, of a, a very wide talent pool and then even within that you're then making sure that you have a data point immediately that speaks to your values that you can then use as a screening measure and know whether or not you know these candidates are ones that you want to then take through to you know a screening phase or, or something to that effect so that tends to be my my stance when it just comes to the pure um you know the, the advertising platforms i think this is why it also frustrates frustrates me that in recruitment more and more people aren't aren't really thinking about the candidate persona because we um you know actually <laughs> The irony about that is that that we when we're building out requirements that that immediately gives us our candidate persona. Now, what we don't then do instead of taking that that requirements and turning it into a persona for our, our engagement strategy. So so whether it's reach out, whether it's advertising, what whatever it is, we then just apply it to as a filter to the applications that we actually receive. So so what we should be doing is in a you know in that context taking the requirements, turning that into into a candidate persona. And if anybody wants an example of that, then um, I don't have it in this deck. Um, but but please, you know, drop me a note and I'll send it to you. But you know, think about okay, the the way use all the tools that are available out there to think about first of all the way that you're writing the type of content that's going out. So think. Things like textual, okay, it's expensive textual, but see if you're in a high volume environment, it's so worth it because it will really help you narrow down um, the, the type of language that, that you want to use. The the second thing is, you know, like Neil said, think about the channels that it's actually actually going across. Um, do do you use programmatic at all, Neil? Is that is that something that you've you've started using yet, or are you are you simply using more algorithm algorithmic based job boards and job postings? 
as well. Anything that is actually going to hone in on on who your target is, I'm, I'm quite fond of. Like, there's even those there's the you know the you know we use one of the platforms that's normally these days used as a bad word, but we use one of those platforms just for the real basic mark like um, content driven marketing, and then we have got the algorithmic advertising, and then we have programmatic as well. Each of them obviously they'll they'll differ in terms of volume and uh, and they'll differ in terms of quality, but ultimately the aim uh, when you're doing that is you know it's just to quite simply make sure that anyone that's coming in, um, well there has to be an ROI. So I mean if obviously if you're getting minimal volume, is it worth the money? But then you know if if it is worth the money, just making sure it's then relevant as they come in. And what this does, what these techniques that Neil's talking about, what it does is it immediately cuts down, you know, you're, you might be targeting your total addressable market, but what it immediately does is starts to, to cut down um, the numbers. Um, candidates are educated consumers. Don't let anybody tell you anything else about your potential candidate market. Um, candidates will, if they're at the advert, if the content um, is written in the correct way, candidates will not waste their time. Okay, you might get a small number all the time of people applying who are completely irrelevant but candidates do not want their time wasted. So through, through reach out, through um, advertising, um, whether it's the type of message that you're writing on LinkedIn or the type of email that, that, that you're composing, give the candidate enough information to make a decision as an educated human being about whether they are interested in that vacancy. Give candidates the credit that they deserve and give them a high level of service and your, you know, your, your addressable market. You, you'll quickly start to only see people who are at least on paper or interested um, in, in your vacancy. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk for a second just about the, the candidate ID approach to this, and I'm just going to show numbers. Um, I, I can't talk in detail just due to NDA about the, the, the specifics around this client, but but this is a campaign that we're currently working through um, with, with a client for that. It's a high volume global campaign for, for candidates, and, and it's, a, it's quite an interesting approach. Our typical primary use case here at Candidate ID is we want to target your, your ATS data and, and target candidates who are being sourced by your sourcing team. Um, that this is going to be this is a slightly different campaign that we've started for, for this client. And that we're not actually targeting their existing ATS and CRM data. Um, what we're targeting is wholly and exclusively A candidates who are being sourced by their, their sourcing team because they do have a high volume sourcing team, but also candidates who are coming in through multiple other sources such as advertising, paid social, organic social and programmatic as well. So this is all net new candidates who, who are being approached. approached now, as I said, it's a global campaign, so we're working in loads and loads of different regions for them. So we're working in America, we're working in, in APAC, um, EMEA, um, DACH in particular is a big, a big growth region for them as well. And we're looking to hire 250 people as a result of this campaign. And we've only just started the campaign, so we, we are still very early doors. But this is the, the estimate so of, well, actually, we're at a point where we've got a figure for their engagement. Now, traditionally, if you look at the left-hand side column, traditionally, if they were just using their ATS and CRM um, to do this, um, to, to hit their numbers, they're still going to have to source uh, or get applications from around about 6,000 people. But what then happens is instead of focusing on people who they know are engaged with what's happening, they immediately would traditionally start to engage with those 6,000 people who are implying by, t by telephone. So now they are a big team, okay, they are a big global function, so they can, they do have the capacity to contact that many people. But think about the amount of time that, that they're actually spending spending doing that. They're contacting every single candidate um, to do that. Now, what they've done with candidate ID instead, instead of following um, that traditional traditional process that they follow is that every person who applies for the vacancy or every single person who's sourced for the vacancy is going into a nurture campaign. Now, it's a five-stage nurture campaign by email predominantly. It starts to introduce the employer and give them more information about the employer because they are a business-to-business -business brand and the vast majority of candidates do not know who the employer is. So they're giving them more, more information. Here Here's what the employer does. Here's what the opportunity is. Here's a bit of information about what a typical day 
day in the week actually looks like. Now, what that immediately does is it cuts down the 6,000 applications down to 3,181 people. That's about 54% of, of the people who have applied. They are the people who are engaging with the platform, uh, with the content as it's going out. Now, they use candidate ID to track email activity, to track activity across specific job vacancy, um, job vacancies that are posted, but also activity across other channels as well, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. So they immediately are getting into a situation where they can contact almost half of the, the applications instead of instead of having to contact all 6,000 people. They can automatically, actually using candidate ID as well, send a, a thanks but no thanks email to the 6,000 people who aren't engaged and who aren't motivated. And you can see their estimates as we go down to interview one, interview two and, and, and higher. They're, they're at each stage they're cutting out at least half of the amount of time spending on the conversation uh, sorry on engagement with the candidate so by focusing on people who are actually motivated through engagement that they're saving a substantial amount of time now also you know you what we can argue um, as well um, and based on what we're doing with other clients is that the quality of the candidates will also improve because it is only people who are engaging with the content and who are naturally interested it's the type of vacancy in this campaign that can traditionally um, you know attract candidates who really haven't got any other option you know so by by doing this what we're doing is cutting out the tire kickers we're cutting out the the time wasters and we're quickly helping the client to actually get to people who who are motivated um, instead of just applying um, for for the sake of imply, applying Neil you and I've worked together this year on a, on a couple of different campaigns for for um, a pre previous employer but what what from a content perspective and from an engagement perspective whether that's email text messaging um, any any other channel what what methods of engagement have worked really well to help you identify who your team should be really speaking to um, to be honest you know to, to speak to the the campaigns that we have run you know when is I think it's less about the channel it's more about the content that you're actually standing out you know if you like you said before you referenced it before and I think you you, you nailed it um, you know, we, you need to, you know, give candidates something that they want to read. You need to, you know, think about who your core demographic is. Think of them as humans and think about whether or not they, you know, they want to just hear another one of 125 reach outs from a TA person that they've got, you know, that month. Or whether or not they want to hear a little bit about something that might be in their interest set. So, for example, you spent some time with, um, you know, with, with me putting together content that was from, our, you know, the co-founders of the business, learning a bit more about the tech stack, learning a bit about the problems we're trying to solve for the industry that those products, you know, the, the products serve. Um, and, and you know, we, we put that campaign together in a way where, you know, you could very clearly then track, um, you know, engagement levels and, and who was where. And then it, by the end of it, we then did have a situation similar to what you just described of, um, is then a case of, okay, the, the, it then became a, how much time do we have to make sure we get across all of these engaged candidates? And, um, you know, so a great problem to have. Um, you know, like obviously when you when you look at just pure bottom of funnel numbers there. The other the other aspect of that is, you know, you've got the fact that yes, you, you can get to a point where you have the, the active candidates at the bottom of that funnel, but then um, you know, from a pure employer branding perspective, if you're, you know, as as most of you know most people are aware, you know, it's it's easy to. Or I'm not going to say it's easy. That every every organisation has its complexities, but uh, I would say it's easier to recruit for a, a big brand, for a brand that already has its brand and already has its name. It's harder to do it for an innocuous brand. I tend to try and focus on helping innocuous brands higher and higher at a very high level. So when you're using that content to put your brand out there in the right light, um, you know, shining light on the things that, you know, are the, the great parts of the story to tell, you know, you, you naturally then get your, you know, your core demographic from that targeting, you know, gravitating towards the business. So um, again, it's, it's that first step towards bringing that traffic inbound as opposed to it all being pure outbound. Absolutely. And, and, and all that this activity gets you to a situation where you're giving your candidates enough information, actually, to, like I said, to, to make, make that decision themselves. Um, the, the numbers, the ratios themselves will, will actually sort themselves out. You, candidates will opt out. Um, candidates, again, give crack candidates, you know, a lot of credit. If you give them the right information um, through the process, like what you were talking about there in terms of information about the tech stack, information about the problem that, that's trying to be solved 
involved. You know, you know that's that's an important one as well. Actually, be clear about what your product or, or your service is. Some candidates it will really appeal to them. Some some candidates it's, it, it won't. You know, I, in fact, I was talking to someone about this the other day, and in the banking industry, for example, if we, you know, it's prominent in Glasgow. There's lots and lots of big banks. It personally doesn't appeal to me, but actually fintech does you know it's different you know and that's because it's a different problem that, that's trying to be solved so so give enough information that allows candidates to, to make a decision um about whether whether they're interested in you or not um and, and, well, Billy, um i'll supplement that as well just with something extra i thought was an interesting piece of information it's an extra dynamic that um and i'm not into just i know i'm on the candidate id Way a webinar with you, but I'm generally not the person that would just blow smoke up your backside because I'm on the webinar with you. But um, I actually had some of my ex colleagues from you know the business in question let me know that they were they've they've recently hired people who through their application process did reference that they remembered getting advertising content or content about who we were earlier, which was their the beginning of their their understanding of of who we are. Um, and then so you know if you if you just think about the the growing sentiment that that creates with the candidate and how that starts to align them from a very early stage that might then have that come back later so um so yeah just interesting extra you know dynamic to um to that process too yeah absolutely and and what that highlights is this is a longer term approach this is a strategic approach yes you can you know save time um quickly by using it tactically but you know the more more time that you spend you know front front ending this process the more time you spend setting it up the the and the longer that, that it runs the more time you, you that you'll save and you'll get organic people coming back and what we've seen with other clients actually on that as well is as well as what you're saying um you know, uh, people returning perhaps after three months, four months, six months after receiving the content, they then the reputation of the employer starts to build within the local market, um, and you get a lot more organic referrals coming through. So there's a technology business in London that we've done some work with um, actually, and they've seen significant referrals coming off coming off the back of it um, as well. So there, there's lots and lots and lots of different benefits to that. And ju just think about you know that again, I'm, I'm talking about the content side in particular here think about all the different places that your candidates will um, look at look at the content that this is where again you know let let your candidates know exactly what you're doing and give them the opportunity to take a look at relevant content on lots and lots of different channels this saves your recruiters time because your recruiter isn't chasing people they're not chasing candidates across lots and lots of different platforms on lots and lots of different channels just give candidates um, content on the channels that you know that they're likely to visit and that's all built into your pet candidate persona at the beginning you know where is a techie more likely to hang out you know where is a hospitality candidate more likely to hang hang out uh, i think sometimes we forget this this was recruitment 101 do you know it's about going you know if i if i'm working in financial services then you know my candidates are going to be hanging out in the pubs and the bars near the banks do you know that was a basic one well now it's okay if you're a techie candidate then are you, you're going to be hanging out online probably Probably on Reddit, you know, you're probably going to have a also referencing Slack and get and, and, and all these different things as well. So just just don't forget um, to to build that into your persona. Um, that, that and that's where the big time, the big other time saving comes around content is the the automatic scheduling and um, you know being able to in advance pre plan the the engagement that's going on. So with a tool like Candidate ID, um, as soon as a candidate in the case of the client I was talking about, as soon as the candidate applies um, for for a vacancy, they automatically drop into a candidate ID campaign and they automatically get the phases of content sent out. So this isn't a manual process. There's not someone sitting emailing every single individual candidate that comes in. It's all programmed so that the candidate receives content at the right time. Um, we can put time delays on content and we can put scheduling in place so that they receive it on specific dates and time. But we can also set up all automation rules that mean if a candidate, like I said, if a candidate doesn't engage with the content, um, then they'll automatically just receive a rejection email. They'll receive something that says thanks, thanks, but no thanks. So automation of this message, you know, think about this. This is a nurture campaign over the period of four weeks with another client, actually, not the client who I'm talking about um, with the, the previous numbers. But this is 16 individual emails, actually, that, that are sent as part of this campaign. How long would it take your recruiters to send 16 emails to hundreds and hundreds of candidates manually 
it takes too much time. So to think about the, the, the tools and the platforms like Candidate ID that you can use to automatically schedule that. Now, it might be that you're a small business, you might have a small team, you might not um, you know, be able to, to, to pay you know, for a more enterprise product like Candidate ID for, for Nurture. There are other cheaper drip tools available there that are available for tens of pounds a month that allow you to do one or two or three emails as part of a trip, uh, a drip campaign. It doesn't allow you to do the full Nurture like Candidate ID does. It doesn't let you schedule as far in advance, but there are plenty of tools out there that let you schedule some of this and let you see some basic information like when candidates have opened, opened an email as well. So don't think that this is restricted just to, to larger businesses. If you work in a small team, um, then then you know you can do it. But ultimately, the benefit of candidate ID from a bigger organisation perspective, from an enterprise perspective, is you can see not just when a candidate opens an email like John, but you can see when they've clicked on links, when they've viewed landing pages, when they've viewed your website, when they've viewed your job spec on your website, and then all the automation and actually the scoring. That, that comes comes with that as well, um, and that just gets you into a position where you can see, you know, ac across your database who's hot um, and 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 who's not. You can see very quickly who's clicked on your job vacancies, um, who's clicked on your landing pages, and that empowers your recruiters in so many different ways. Not only does it save them time because they get to the hot candidates, the candidates who they want to speak to, to to straight away, but when they're reaching out, it gives them more in information about the candidates it gives some information about what posts what job posts what blogs what videos what information that the candidate is consuming and i build that you and your recruiters would build that um, into into the reach out um, as well so um now we are uh currently running at about 35 minutes if anyone's got any questions then you know please feel to to throw those into the mix um neil you know just just to to finish off we've, we've had some great um you know, tips there for saving time through, throughout um, the, the past 35 minutes. Um, what, what are you putting in place in your new business um, in, in particular? You're, we, we spoke briefly beforehand, you're currently um, putting a lot of processes and a lot of governance um, into, into your, new, your new business and your new team and um, putting in um, a, a global talent acquisition function um, that, that's going to be absolutely super efficient. What, what things are you putting in place that you would recommend that people start thinking about? About for 2019. Um, look, for me right now, it's it's about putting in place um, a, an ecosystem and a platform that will scale well. So around you know in terms of all the way through from candidate attraction all the way through until contract signing, um, tech enabled, efficient, automated wherever it needs to be, um, but incredibly you know scalable in terms of the integrations to the various different tools along that pipeline. So that's a key thing. Um, and then yeah, obviously and, and realistically when you're building out a base, iteration one is it you know doesn't have some of the bells and whistles that will be bolting into iteration two um, because the arguments in order to support the funding for iteration two and three will be built by the, the time saving and the, and the limiting the low value activity um, that we create from iteration one. Um, so, you know, it can be anything from, you know, simply, you know, simplistic use of, you know, e-signed, uh, e-signed technology or, or sourcing or CRM capability early on, like you say, to, you know, using things like automated email scheduling and CRM capability to, to make that reach out more manageable. Um, it can be, um, you know, it's really just anything that's going to take a, a repetitive or extra process step away. Um, and but then obviously you want that, you know, centralization. If you can't measure something, you can't manage it. So from end to end, everything needs to be fully integrated, fully able to be measured and timestamped the whole way through. Um, and so that you can then start building out your reporting metrics, building out what, you know, effective and efficient TA looks like for different regions and different demographics and, and so on. Um, and then from there, you then start building out. So, you know, the building out will be the addition of, uh, of extra assessment tooling and extra automation and the um, building out of, uh, or the, in fact, the, the internal building of some nice, um, nice tooling as well. So, um, but that's, uh, that's all to come down the line. Fantastic. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to finding out um, how, how that goes. So um, uh, best of luck. I'm, I'm sure it will be uh, massively, massively successful. Um, so, Thank you. Listen, Neil, I really appreciate you taking the time out, especially when you're so late um, in Sydney. Um, uh, it's a, a big ask to, to jump on a call so late, um, so, so greatly appreciated. Um, mm -hmm. 
I hope you have a, a fantastic Christmas. To, to everyone who's joined us, thank you very much indeed um, for, for joining us. A recording of the session will be sent out, so feel free to, to send it um, out to your, your colleagues and friends, you know, maybe wrap it up in a, in a, in a bow and, and leave it under their Christmas tree. I'm, I'm sure they would greatly appreciate that. Um, but, but to everyone, um, all the best um, towards the end of the year. I hope you and your family have a great Christmas, have a fantastic new year, and uh, look forward to, to speaking with you all again on a future webinar um, in the new year. Thank you very much indeed, everyone.